Yeah, welcome everyone again. <laughs> um, again, this is just to briefly get together more as a quick reminder that you can't really over communicate. And so it's a five day protocol. Whenever there are any questions, uh, just reach out to any one of us and together we'll get it done. Uh, it's one of those protocols where slow but constant progress is faster than you know, a lot of rapid attempts. Uh, I briefly shared with you guys where we are, so let's skip that. Um, the first thing I briefly wanted to talk about is RNAs. In general, it's good to keep your samples cold when you don't need them, because obviously, as every enzyme, um, RNAs are twice as active with every 10 degree Celsius change to, of course, a certain limit. But as you can see in the little diagram here, um, it is quite some significant difference between ice and 37 degree. So whenever possible, we keep our samples on ice. And whenever we have any reactions, we also do them as cold as possible. For the same reason, we use uh, filter tips. Um, this is because <laughs> the pipette is blowing in air and ejecting it. And so if anything is in the air, that will go into our samples. I briefly wanted to touch on the biggest sources of RNA contamination. And well, RNA is as part of our breath, as well as of our mucus and sweat and touch. So believe it or not, you know, there is the occasional hair or eyebrow that can fall in our samples if we don't have one of those protective plastic shields or the old school radioisotope shields that I like to use. And I think <clears throat> COVID also made a lot of researchers think about breathing into their samples. Um, but yeah, let's just use a protective barrier between us and our samples. And that's just for the simple reason in CSRNA-seq, we have not even femtomoles of RNA. So it's very, very, very little, which makes the assay very sensitive. That being said, RNA is not a magic unicorn that can beam itself or is out there to destroy your samples. Um, it's actually us, so there's no reason to freak out. But there's also, you know, we use, need to use our brain or what I like to say, people using their phones and then just RNA sapping their gloves. That's not doing the job because actually our phones on our ears and our hands, they're full of RNAs. So long story short, these are the sources. So this is how we can avoid it. Um, another quick thing that of course, all of you know, but I wanted to stress one more time is temperature. So usually you keep your enzymes and 50% glycerol at minus 20 in the cooler. And then some people take them out and put them on ice. Well, ice is cold, the freezer is cold. You do understand. But the difference is actually 24 Celsius, which is like 44 Fahrenheit, which is the same as taking you right now. I mean, we have 72 in beautiful California and throwing you into a 50 degree Celsius or 120 degree Fahrenheit water bath. I mean, you wouldn't be happy. So long story short, you do that a few times and your enzymes don't work as well anymore. Um, and uh, particularly the ligases are a bit more finicky than the typical restriction enzyme or polymerase that you might have been working with. Another quick comment I wanted to say is um, basically when temperature ch changes are quick, you have a smaller likelihood of your molecule of in um, interest to reach sort of um, an intermediate equilibrium. And why is this important? Well, a key part of CSRNA-seq is the five prime enrichment. So we heat the RNA up and cool it down very quickly to melt the RNA and reduce secondary structure make the 5 prime end amenable with the enzymes that want to modify it. So that also means that this quick change from 70 degree, 70 degree Celsius or 75 to ice needs to be as rapid as possible. And also in general, when we have samples, let's say we go from ice to 37 degree, it's best to directly move them from ice to 30, 37 degree. So every time there is a temperature shift, let's make that as rapid as possible. All right, a little bit of background. Well, when we talk about gene regulation, it is important to note that, you know, the RNA as captured by RNA-seq, as we like to refer to here as, let's see if I get my PowerPoint here, as a steady state RNA, well, it might actually not be expressed at that moment because it's stable, so it's in the cell. So the RNA that's present in the cell, the steady state RNA, is different from what is currently 
ongoing in transcription, which is sometimes referred to as nascent or ongoing transcription. CSRNA-seq does not capture the steady state transcript, but the ongoing one, and therefore it's more sensitive. So to look into that a little bit further, this is one of our favorite loci. So that's P1 loci that encodes P1. And you can nicely see how here look, the RNA-C captures the introns, uh, sorry, the exons, but CSRNA-C captures a number of other start sites throughout that genomic region. And uh, yeah, lo and behold, these start sites also correlate with proseq, which basically captures nascent transcription and correlates with markers of open chromatin and active transcription. Speaking therefore, that these start sites are actually real places where transcription occurs. Given that it captures nascent transcription, while CSRNA-seq does not only capture genes or stable non-coding RNAs, but also enhance our RNAs, and a lot of other unstable transcripts that were discovered in a <laughs> multitude in their names. But let's just summarize them as divergent transcripts, undesensed transcripts, and of course also pre-microRNAs, like microRNAs before they're processed. And if you wonder why is it important to not only capture promoters, but also these unstable transcripts? Well, one of, at least my favorite manuscripts shows that in B cells and manuscripts, <laughs> macrophages, they both require um, Q.1. And if you see here, the majority of the different binding among these two cells are actually distal, so not in promoters, while the common bounding events are in the promoters, but there's no real differential P1 binding to promoters. So if you want to understand the transcription factors and how they basically generate unique environments and cell differentiation, it's important to look at both stable and unstable transcription start sites or at promoters or enhancers. The reason I don't always like to use the word enhancers is, you know, in the 80s, particularly plant people put a lot of effort into, <laughs> into categorizing certain DNA regions that have a phenotype and enhance transcription. Well, I think these days, enhancers is just loosely thrown around as something that has some genomic signature as correlating with transcription activity. But if you CRISPR them out, there's often a phenotype. So that's why I will more commonly refer to them promoters enhance us stable and unstable transcripts as uh, transcription start regions, just to not you know, emphasize any functionality. So what is the benefit of capturing nascent RNAs? Um, here, a brief figure from the paper. Um, well, long story short is you capture a ton more, right? Your signal is not camouflaged or overshadowed by from what's present in the cell previously, and as shown here, when we stimulate macrophages with KLA, which is just telling these uh, immune cells that there is some bacteria floating around somewhere, and they go, of course, crazy trying to protect. Well, you capture about 350 differentially regulated genes with mRNA, but over 20,000 differentially regulated TSRs, so promoters, enhancers, and fourth knot, using CSRNA-seq. And I don't need to tell you what's easier to identify the motifs <laughs> that underlie the signaling. I mean, you just have more computational power. A quick word on nascentness. Um, of course, CROSIC, PROSIC, which is basically you make nuclei, you let the polymerase run on incorporated artificial nucleotides and IP that is the most nascent of the methods. Um, it comes with its own kind of worms, including that it's actually not reproducible or harder to reproduce, to generate reproducible data. Um, it's technically more challenging. You can't always purify nuclei. And of course, the biggest problem is if I give you a tissue, <laughs> each cell has a different sensitivity to detergent and mechanic shearing. So it's really hard to generate nuclei from any complex sample that reflects the cell, um, the stochasticity of the cells in that tissue. Well, then you have all these different methods where you basically throw these nucleotides into the dish um, whether it's force u or gt seq or brdu seq and long story short in this time the nucleotides go into the cells they get incorporated and then you basically do rna seq after an ip for these modified nucleotides it gives you an idea of which transcripts were on at that very moment when you threw in those nucleotides so this pulse chase usually is for five to ten minutes and of course you have all these which i think are still very nascent but not completely nascent methods such as NetSeq, 
start seek, septap, and of course, CSN seek. What is the issue with those methods? Well, we don't have a proof that these polymerases can elongate after we capture them because we basically kill them, right? We throw on trisol, go for all the small RNAs. We don't know if these transcripts were simply paused or whether they were actually had the potency to elongate. And of course, RNA-seq, which is not nascent at all. So when we talk about gene regulation, it is also important to quickly point out that we are interested usually in polymerase two. Um, there are three different eukaryotic polymerases. And as seen here, pol 2 with the mRNAs and a part of non-coding RNAs, whether it's by mass or by sheer number, right? Blue for pol 1, red for pol 3, pol 2 is vastly in the minority. Well, that's not a big problem because luckily pol 2 transcripts, but not pol 1 and pol 3, have this cap. And this is exactly what we exploit in CSRNA-seq. Lucky us, that cap is added 18 to 20 nucleotides into transcription, which also slows down this early initiation um, process. So this is a quick run through about CSNA-seq. And of course, the cooler thing ever is that we can actually use total RNA, -seq, uh, total RNA to capture transcription start sites. Why is this? Well, as all of you know, now we can use fax sorted cells, fixed cells, anything that you can get RNA from, and it's eukaryotic, we can do the method. We'll talk about it in detail, but just a quick first introduction to the method is we basically take total RNA and run it over a gel. And then we purify the RNA that is smaller than the smallest steady state RNA, so the RNA that's always present in the cell. And by theory, these small RNAs have to be in the process of being generated or have been degraded. So because they could have been degraded, we take about a 10% input. And this is just a total short RNA input. The remainder, these 90%, we cap enrich. So anything that doesn't have a cap, we try to remove the phosphates. So they're no longer subject to adapter ligation during library preparation. We do that using two different enzymes. One is the terminator, which removes monophosphate, but that is a five prime dependent um, phosphate nuclease or RNAs that is not very efficient. And so, as you can also see, um, <laughs> microRNAs, which have a five prime phosphate, often have steric hindrance and so are not as efficiently degraded by this enzyme. So, that's why we use a second enzyme that you all know called SIP, which just removes mono di triphosphates, but it doesn't remove caps. And so, then basically, hopefully, we have all of our small RNAs that have not a cap dephosphorylated or degraded. So then when we decap it, we have monophosphate, monophosphate 5 prime ended mRNA, uh, small RNA that then can be used for library preparation. And again, this is just a quick primer. We'll talk about it in details in a couple of slides. But now you might be wondering, okay, how do we know actually call transcription start site? And it's pretty easy. CSNA seq has an input at a CSNA seq library. And by the way, you can use these input libraries beautifully to study microRNAs and other small RNAs. But how do we distinguish sort of these RNAs that are ongoingly transcribed from degradation product? Well, we actually do differential peak calling between the transcription start site or the CSRNA seq input at the CSRNA seq input and the CSRNA seq. And so, for example, microRNAs, of course, heavily enrich in the input. Um, degradation um, pro products are about equal, while those that are really rigorously enriched in CSRNA seq um, have a high correlation with nascent transcription starts. How do we know that? Well, there's actually a really good correlation between CSRNA seq and real nascent methods such as CSRNA, uh, such as GrowSeq or ProCap. So let's run through the first day. What we're going to do is we purify our small RNA. And the way we do that is we run our total RNA over a gel, and then we stain that using cyber green. We don't need a marker because we added two dyes, one the xylene xynol and the bromphenol blue, which run at about 55 and about eight base pairs, given the concentration of acrylamide on the urea gel. And then we basically cut under the first line that we see. So we basically cut where we don't see any RNA. 
If you think it's fun, you can always stain this gel with a more sensitive dye like cyber gold. And then you will see there is a little bit of smear coming up. But the problem is it will be harder to see this clear distinguish distinction between steady state RNA and what is smaller than the steady state RNA. So here is a question I often get, well, gels suck, I agree. Uh, they will never get FDA approval. How can we do this whole thing gel free? And there are a number of ideas that we tried out, um, but so far there was nothing that really was cutting it. And most people would propose SPRI beads and um, using SPRI beads and ethanol, you can indeed get good size selection. But the one thing that people, or that we have to keep in mind is, so this is basically the small RNA that we're interested in, right? And then there's this edge, and there's this massive amount, like if you draw it to scale, it won't even be on the screen anymore, of stuff that you don't want. And as beads purify using these sort of Gaussian distributions, even if you get 1% of that what you don't want, right? If we look back, this is so much more RNA that this will quickly quench your library. Is this a problem? Not necessarily. Like if you ever run in a project where you need to do 400 samples, well, we're gonna use beads. But then we need to sequence them really deep because the majority of your reads will be junk and you have to then bioinformatically do the size selection. So because it's currently more efficient, and again, we are also working on methods to improve that, we'll do the gel, and particularly also because it's lower input. So here's a quick uh, reminder and just writing sort of the enzymes down, which is the five prime terminator, again, removes the monophosphate, the phosphatate that removes um, basically unprotected phosphates. It would not remove an adenyl group, it would not remove a cap, but it does, does remove a monodi or triphosphate. Then here we heat and chill and repeat the phosphate by just using the same sample. So this is different from the method video that we posted quite a while ago. And we're very fortunate that NAB actually came out with a thermostable SIP, the quick SIP. And that allowed us now to just use the same enzyme throughout this process. Here we do a triazole purification. If you're super low input, this is not absolutely essential, but I highly recommend it because you want to really get rid of the SIP. And um, following the trisole purification, then we can go into the library prep. Okay, so a quick summary of that. What would you find in these two libraries? In your input libraries, you find the same thing as in your CSA, CS on a seq libraries. But as you will see when you do the experiment, this is actually a tiny fraction of what's in the input libraries. So within the input libraries, the vast majority of these species, which are basically the monophosphorylated microRNAs, as well as short, small RNAs, snow RNAs. And some of them are even capped and sneak through, and that happens, and that's why we have the input to filter them out. But the vast majority are microRNAs, pi RNAs. And those of you who work in like fun organisms, including worms or whatever, you actually also see a RNAi and other fun uh, PV signaling methods if you were in Drosophila in the small RNA library too. So briefly talking about the library prep, there are different kits that you can use. I personally like the NEB kit for two reasons. It's fairly cheap. It's still about 4,000 for 96 samples, but we can actually get up to 250 out of a kit. Um, the other reason is that the buffers in the NAB kit are compatible with this RPPH. And we basically use the library prep that we already published in the Hetzel paper for 5 prime proseq which has the advantage that we can just add the RPPH into the first um, buffer that is provided by the kit and sort of make this whole into one process. So let's run ourselves through. So now we have our input RNA, which is everything, and then we have our 5 prime enriched RNA. So in order to generate libraries, we need five prime phosphorylated, three prime OH RNA. That's why we use RPPH. RPPH is basically a polyphosphatase, PP, and you could also use human decapping enzymes or so forth, but RPPH is really nice in the way that it's a um, pyrophosphatase and therefore just removes everything. And so the RPPH removes caps, adenyl groups, triphosphates, B-phosphates, and makes monophosphates out of that. 
like any chemical five from modification that has more than uh, one phosphate or two and more, the two phosphates gets cleaved and you end up with a monophosphate. So now that you have a monophosphate, we can actually basically go through the NA, uh, small RNA workflow. The first thing we're going to do is we add a three prime adapter. This is T4RNA ligase two dependent. And a quick note here is that in the kit, this is the T4RNA ligase two truncated. It is not the KQ mutant. So if you're really anal about phosphorylation, um, you might have to switch it out to the KQ mutant. But so far, we did not experience any problems with that. So now that we have then the adapter ligated, the next thing we want to do is we actually hybridize the primer. This is done because the T4RNA ligase one, which we knew in the next step, to like it on the five prime adapter, has absolutely no interest in double-stranded DNA-RNA hybrids. And in this case, this is actually a DNA-DNA hybrid because lucky else the three prime adapter is DNA. And therefore this severely reduces our adapter dimers. Here, a quick word of caution. The three prime adapters are five prime adenylated, you see, APPH. And so uh, those of you who are <laughs> paid attention, we realized that RPPH would actually de-adenylate free prime adapter. Well, lucky us, as described in the Hetzel paper, RPPH is not active at 22 and 25 degrees. So this is why it's important in the protocol to do the three prime adapter ligation at 22 degrees. It also works at 25, but um, you know, 23 is probably the best. After that, we anneal to actually generate this double stranded. And then, uh, sorry, here we are. Then we ligate on the five prime adapter, which is RNA. Once we ligate on the five prime adapter with T4RNA ligase one, which you can do at 16 degrees overnight or just an hour or an hour and a half at room temperature, then we can do the RT and we have stable CR, uh, CDNA. A personal word about that I think the rate limiting step in the protocol would be the five prime adapter ligation. So in a protocol, I say an hour, an hour, an hour, but if you do that for two hours, it will not be um, bad for your, for your samples. It will actually, there is a chance that it improves it, but usually with one hour, you get enough. Okay, following that is a PCR, and then we do another cleanup. And that step is important because we already did a nice um, size selection on the RNA gel, but as you all noticed, um, you know, we cut approximately and there will always be a little bit of uh, larger fragments that sneak in as well as smaller fragments. And so we can really redo the gel purification on the uh, DNA level where we have nice markers. And this is why basically I also personally don't even use markers for the RNA selection. So the DNA size selection may look like this. Uh, long story short, at about 125, you see your adapter dimer running at 118. If you have a nice CS on ASIC library, you have this smear followed by around 175, this band, which corresponds <laughs> through the, uh, for the first stable RNA, the first steady state RNA. And yes, we cut below, but it's like a billion to one. So there's always something sneaking through. Some people think a, a gel is really reptating like perfectly in line. I mean, it's not a Gaussian distribution as SPRI beads, but nevertheless, you know, it's not a absolutely sharp. So there's always this little tail that sneaks in and this is this band. Sometimes you see this band, which are sort of these adapted trimers uh, or concatomers. And if your library failed, you basically have nothing here. For your input libraries, uh, this is unfortunately overexposed you will see that the lower band is a lot stronger. So this is your micro RNA. All right, I'll be back in a second. Okay, and I have no idea what I said, but long story short, um, because it's so important, if I haven't said it, I repeat it. Um, let's, let's always load the sample and the input next to each other. So then we cut, we cut them identical. Okay. Um, so here is a quick summary of the complete protocol one more time. And so let's briefly talk about the advantages and disadvantages of CSRNA-seq. 
Well, of course, no doubt the biggest advantage is that you can use total R. And <laughs> it's just a completely new paradigm to capture active transcription start site in total R because it allows you to capture this from any fresh, frozen, bang, fixed cell wall tissue whatsoever. So whether you have a pathogen inside a cell that might replicate in the cytosol, or you might have to fix your sample because there'd be a cell three or four, um, basically you name it, as long as it's eukaryotic, you can capture the small RNAs that are actively initiating or sort of the start sites. It's a robust and um, relatively easy assay that's also a lot cheaper than 5.0-seq which makes us even use the assay now in cell lines when we do our experiments rather than 5 prime growth seq And of course, it gives us single nucleotide resolution is strand specific. So some people like to argue about H3K27, a saddle is a good mark if you have cross-linked tissues or samples. Well, yes and no. First of all, there's a number, several lines of evidence, particularly during gazophila development that the mark is at promoters that are odd, that are inactive while it's lacking at other promoters that is active. And of course, 27 acetyl is downstream of transcription. So it doesn't mean transcription is happening right at that moment. Furthermore, um, yeah, I'm a big proponent of the transcription start site because we often like to study gene regulation from the perspective of a factor, let's say chip seek or from a specific peak. But we forget that transcription start sites are highly dynamic and they differ between different cell types. And therefore, uh, <laughs> you might actually think that a certain factor is activating, although it's repressive because it binds right in the plus 25 copromotor region and therefore like, blocks sterically on a polymerase recruitment. So transcription start site is very important information. And as shown here briefly, CSNA-seq basically gives you the same information for this BIM-1 enhancer as nascent methods such as GROCAP or COPRO. Of course, there are also um, disadvantages with the method, which is we capture small and, well, very rare species of RNA. And as such, um, they're not allele specific because they're not long enough to um, distinguish the two chromosomes. Um, it will never be a single cell technology and it works best with higher amounts of RNA, which is about one microgram of total RNA. Um, Perhaps a couple of points, again, on why transcription start sites are very powerful, and I argue even better than capturing the locus of an enhancer or promoter. And of course, this is done with my own personal biases. Um, as insinuated earlier, transcription start sites are dynamic, and if we compare here these three cell lines, um, you will actually see that only about 35% of the genes, so here we only look at promoters that are conserved or that are expressed in all three of those cell lines, right? And so among those that are co-expressed in all these three cell lines, and it's only promoters which are less flexible than the non-coding or the enhancers, only about 35% have identical start sites. The rest varies to various degrees. So start sites are dynamic. And of course, if you would now throw these three cell lines by accident or experiment into the same dish, you know, you might end up with this. And if you would capture the gene and it is on in all three, you would not know where it comes from unless there's a very specific um, splice site that varies. But with CSNA-seq, you can actually distinguish the start sites and sort of deconvolute your cell lines. Well, of course, in 2021, we don't throw different cell lines into the same bucket unless we do some ES fun. I'm more talking about tissues, right? You can actually decode total RNA from tissues and um, sort of do cyber sorting on the start sites to understand if your gene was on in one cell or the other, um, which is something that we commonly use in blood. Uh, for all of you, now that you're start site experts, however, this is not the way uh, this first transcription initiation works. So a few words on that. In textbooks, you often hear about focus promoters, Tadabox, single start sites, blood. Less than 8% of human promoters do that. The vast majority of human promoters have multiple start sites, so-called dispersed. But this means that all these start sites usually happen within the same cell, often within the same promoter, which and it's not an accumulation of different cells. Okay? So this is not the mode how dispersed transcription initiation works. But that's just a side note, and we can talk about it in the course. 
So a quick question, are these shift in transcription start site meaningful? And I think so. Again, a bias here is from some work we are hopefully getting out soon. This is the RPS11 gene, which has a different start sites between HeLa cells and MCF7 cells. And as you can see, um, this results to differences in protein expression of one treatment of these cells with the mTOR inhibitor um, TORIN1. And the model for that is basically that mTOR is upstream of um, basically translation regulation and response to growth nutrients, uh, growth factors in nutrients. And upon phosphorylation of mTOR, it mediates via LAB1 um, phosphorylation and repression of these EIF4 proteins that is required for translation. But this LAB1 actually likes the CTTT, this poly Y stretch. And so in MCF7 cells, by shifting your start site downstream, you lack this binding site for LAB1. And therefore, you're no longer um, dependent on mTOR signaling because mTOR actually uses a lot of the times these ribosomal protein genes to repress translation. So, yes, I think shifts in start sites are meaningful. Not always, but it can have dramatic biological impact. So last thing, I just want to briefly give you a couple of examples where we already use CSNA seq with um, a couple of references. And this is more sort of for your inspiration, right? So then we don't need to do the same thing over and over again. But maybe, I mean, why do we have methods, right? Methods, you know, method development, we try to bring new approaches to answer existing questions from a new perspective or to, to gain additional data that previously were not possible to actually advance sciences. And well, why I argue it's important to capture the transcription start sites. So one easy example is when we capture start sites and then map the DNA binding motifs of transcription factors relative to the start site, we see that a lot of transcription factors actually have these magical patterns so similar as the Tata box, which is known to specifically position RNA polymers too, these transcription factors occur in specific pattern, and you even see this beautiful 10 base helical periodicity, which right remind, might remember you, uh, remind you of, yeah, the 10 base pairs of um, the DNA helix. Another thing that's pretty cool is CSNA-seq, you can actually get new time courses of signaling as this time course done by NVIDIA, an undergrad in the lab. And the way is you add your, in this case, macrophages or raw cells, which are pseudo macrophages were simulated with KLA. And then we looked at these nf b binding enhancers and you can really see which enhancers fire first, which comes forward, how they go up and down and basically co-regulate the domains and so forth. But the idea is just, it's very easy to do a lot of samples in the new time courses of course, um, something that I'm more interested in, I did see is only seeking about 60 species by now to study evolution and gene regulation of that. But a very cool thing um, that was worked out and launched by Aaron Collins' lab and is in this paper that hopefully comes out in Nature Communication pretty soon, is that it works with crossing cells. And so what's really neat here, um, what Aaron's lab did is they basically treated some um, dendritic cells in a dish uh, they were infected with Zika virus, and then from the same dish, they saw that the infected from the non-infected ones. Now, of course, you can imagine the same thing with blood. You actually have a control within your own sample, and then performing CSNAC, we were able to decode the pathways, which in the end led to the identification of SREBP as essential for Zika virus infection. A similar example, I just mentioned it here, the preprint is out now is um, there's valley fever that plagues a lot of, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's usually cats and dogs, but also a number of humans. Um, and the symptoms of valley fever vary from basically being asymptomatic, but also to really severe lung scarring up to death. And so we just looked at mycelia, which are sort of the, yeah, the fungus, how it boringly dwells its life in the desert. And as well as its spores, which are not so much fun if you inhale them, they become pathogenic and um, have some parties in your lung that are not more fun for you. But if we looked at these two and relative to the start site, we noticed that this motif that was known to be bound by the warp one transcription factor is enriched specifically in spores. And lo and behold, another group we worked with when they then knocked out warp one 
showed that if this is um, basically depleted, you can no longer transition from mycelia to these pathogenic spores. But that's one of these cool examples where A, you can work with a BSL3 pathogen or with a BSL4 because this RNA is BSL2 plus, but also how basically 4 c and a seq could tell us the underlying biology of, um, you could say, phase transition or change from this developmental stage into this one. And this is important because this one is pathogenic, but this one is all cool with us. Um, another inspiration, of course, you can now handle a number of samples. And as it's RNA, well, you can take blood and just put it on ice. And so this allowed us to study COVID um, patients here from our ICU. And um, long story short, every other day we took a sample, performed CSNA seq, and were able to class them depending on the disease progression, the pathogenesis. And using CSNA seq, then we were actually able to identify motifs that are enriched in patients correlating based on their lung index and realize quite quickly that STAT, SRAE are not very good markers. <laughs> Basically, if those TSRs that are overexpressed and have these ones correlate um, basically with severe lung scarring. While other factors here, most notably the GR factors, um, were actually good markers for you, which helped us to actually um, think about more about glutocorticoids and treatment of COVID patients. And I think I have one more slide here. Yep, this is actually um, one thing that I loved about this study. So you might think about these as tismic plots with markers, but basically all that these are are UMAPs, which is you throw in all the transcription start sites and they naturally cluster this way. And then when you look at expressed genes, you will actually realize that distinct cell populations form their own clusters without prior knowledge. So now when we have these clusters and these are just all transcription start sites, all patients, all day, we can look at those ones that have fast recovery versus prolonged recovery and look at, well, which TSRs are upregulated in one versus the other, and then do specifically motif finding. And as you can see here, those ones that have prolonged recovery have high expression in this group of genes. And then if you do specific motif finding, these genes are enriched for the stat motif so basically it gives you, yeah, I wouldn't say biomarkers, but it gives you an idea about which pathways correlate with a bad prognosis in that moment. And why this is specifically cool is the stat motif is of course also important in T cells, right? So if you would only look at one specific cell, you might say, oh yeah, let's, or here you would only look at neutrophils, let's inhibit a stat pathway. But we all know that would be a terrible idea because we could also now look at a stat motif throughout the whole population and realize that this motif is also critical for other TSRs that correlate with fast recovery. And indeed, you would find stat motifs here. With that, I think I threw a lot in your direction. Uh, uh, I hope you can insert your favorite story here. And so for a suggestion, I would say, um, watch the CS on ASIC video if you feel like it. Um, there is also a link on the HOMA website, the protocols that we send out. Um, there's a YouTube video about the method, but I really, I think what helps if you familiarize yourself with the enzymes, what they do, right? Because if you know what all the enzymes do, you will be less distracted and have more focus on the method itself because you already know what each step is doing and feel free to shoot me a message or we can meet up for questions. And then I would say, I see you Monday at 9.15. All right, see you then.